youtube.com slash Andrew Hilton or slash Andrew Hilton Wine. I can't remember. It's one of the two. Yeah, uh, so there is that as well. So uh, I do apologize for anyone having the, uh, the technical issues. Sometimes we can see it, like when, I, when we saw Lee's video feed go down. Sometimes like we get throttled somewhere out there in internet land, just somebody decides that our feed needs to be compressed down to like one megabyte a second for absolutely no explicable reason. Uh, it just happens and I do apologize for that. Uh, I don't know if the YouTube feed will be any better than the Facebook because it's kind of coming out the same source. But uh, yeah, we're doing our best on that. Everything's running like a dream on our side, so we're not sure exactly why that would be happening. And yeah, I agree. Like $150 for a 21 year, there just aren't 21 years really under $200 anywhere. There's there's odds and sods here and there. I think Aberfeldy's 21 is just a hair under 200 these days, but there's nothing even close to 150 anymore. Nothing with a um, a bottle uh, turnout of 219. <laughs> <laughs> There's 219 bottles of this, and that's it. Uh, Sovereign's a real pleasure to work with because we are able to introduce people to uh, to the whole concept of what goes into those blends that we're eschewing and uh, and turning our nose down. But really, what it, it kind of will showcase what makes uh, let's pick on uh, Royal Salute. How can Royal Salute possibly be so expensive? Well, there's a number of single malts that are in there at 21 years old, and the single grain has to match that in age, too, for them to carry that statement. So that has been uh, cared for for a long time, and it really does come down to what's in the barrel. Uh, Gift-giving, you want to look like a big swinger and have, uh, have somebody you can drop off a 30-year-old bottle that would cost you in the thousands – uh, from a uh, from a single malt, especially if it's in Baccarat Crystal or what have you. Whereas you look at something like the Sovereign, uh, there are other single grain producers out there as well that are getting independently bottled. Um, North British, probably the least sexy name when it comes to Scotch history. It is. Uh, but I've been absolutely blown away by the qualities that we're able to get out of them. I think in terms of single malts, I'm still all about the Girvan, which doesn't show up very often. But, I mean, there's Girvan, North British, Cameron Bridge, uh Invergordon? I'm trying to think of what other ones are really Invergordon, yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's kind of the top four. Um, Gervin's probably my favorite. Uh, Cameron Bridge, you don't see a lot of. No, it's definitely the rarest. I've maybe seen two through the market in the 21 years I've been doing this. We had, uh, we had that uh, Murray McDavid Gold Series Cameron Bridge that melted your brain. It was so good. But in, let's know, talk in, about in this. In the year list. 2006, of course. So good <laughs> yeah. luck finding one of those shells these days. Yeah. 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 So uh, when I mentioned earlier the tabla rasa effect, you know, what comes out is such a light grain. It's almost water white. And like I said, a higher, uh, higher alcohol potential. But another difference between single grain and single malt, single malt whiskeys from Scotland are always 100% barley. That does not apply to single grain whiskey. They can use other grains. North British uses barley, so they're uh, they're not uh, unique in that way. They've they've got that, but they also uh, use maize. And for those of you that skip that French lesson, that's what the uh, they call corn over in the UK. Now they don't eat a lot of corn. Uh, my aunt Lil uh, from Ireland would would just refuse to eat it when she would come over here. It was pig's food. Uh, it was very much used as a as an animal feed. What we would call here, or sorry, what we used to call uh, Indian corn, uh, First Nations corn, just doesn't roll off the tongue. But that, that not exactly supposed to be consumed like sweet corn is. Uh, flint corn is what they call it over there. So it's actually uh, a much of a coarser style of grain, uh, not as high in sugar, but still creates a 72, 75 percent alcohol spirit. Um, that is what this is made of, is a mixture of, uh, of barley and, uh, and corn. And I think the Just end result, for me at least, is you get a lot less of those cereal grain characters underneath. It comes off much more as like a fresh fruit character from the cereal. And then the barrel character just overlays everything. I, we've had this conversation many times. I think 17 is like the oldest I ever want a whiskey. Um, but with single grain, I like it a little bit older. And I'll say 21 to 25 is really just fine for me. Um, something like this is... Uh, Oh, it's so pretty. Um, I get so much barrel It's character. a great place to start. 
We don't uh, we don't typically start at fifty four point eight percent alcohol, um, so this would be a, a cash strength offering after twenty one years. That's still remarkably high, um, but it is so delicate and pretty that uh, it's just holding that alcohol so well. Way to YouTube, Aaron. By the way, thanks for that. What happened? So the YouTube link for this still says Situation Brewing. Oh. So yep, Aaron's YouTubing Sorry, really hard buddy. tonight. That's okay. If I'd have known I was going to be on YouTube, I would have hooked you guys up with my agent because uh, we got to get paid. <laughs> That's fair. Your check's in the mail. I didn't put a stamp on it, and I'm never going Fantastic. to, but your check's in the mail. No, I understand that uh, this might be the first time a lot of people have had single-grain whiskey. And uh, one of the fun things, I will point this out in every tasting I do, but in particular when we start with a single-grain, save some. Because it is the lighter touch, because it is the softer style, and we always would have to start with this in the first place, uh, no matter what it was, single grain, single malt, we always start with the lightest. But it can get absolutely buried in a lineup like we have tonight with, you know, we've got a wine finish, we've got uh, some bourbon cask finish. Um, please save a little bit to revisit it at the end because it will hold up, it will open up, we will get more of that great fruit that, uh, that Kyle was talking about as well. So let this kind of sit for a bit, dirty another glass, don't just knock this one back, and I'd be happy to talk about it again at the end to see what everybody has to say. I'm doing the same, I've got, uh, I've got my glass, I'm setting that aside. I don't, Any I'm questions? already plugged into the audio equipment so I can't leave, but I have got my little bottle standing open and that'll do probably Good man. something. Good man. Yeah, Sean, I'm always guilty of the save some problem is, uh, yeah, not always good at that. Especially with the first one, because we're trying to do the introductions and the welcomes and the everything with the first one. So first one usually gets drank. When you're like quickly. Dean Martin, right? You're hanging out with a drink, you're talking to people, and it just, just gets knocked back. It's, it's what happens. Exactly. All right, well, this is one um, that I'm not going to knock We've had some single grants go through in a while. You ready to go for the next one? Let's go on to the next one. So we got a McDuff here. Now, a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with the name McDuff because uh, there are official distillery bottlings of McDuff in North America, but they never, ever use the name McDuff. Historically, they like the name Glen Deverin. Uh, these days, they just call it The Deverin. Uh, it's something that we see in a 12, and I believe we see an older expression here as well that I don't like as much. Um, but yeah, this is... This is something that's been in the market for quite some time, but never as McDuff. Do you have any idea why we don't see it as McDuff? Does it just sound too generic or too stereotypically Scottish? <laughs> you know, ironically, they really could hang on the, it could be the McDuff, like as in the one that we all know and love from, uh, from the Macbeth play. And that is definitely where the name certainly comes from in that reference. And I don't know why it is something that uh, is a bit of an oddball. They, uh, you know, typically... What you can't even look up on several of the websites that I do research on. You actually look up McDuff. You don't look up Glen Deverin. You look up McDuff, and then there's a little side note like, oh, all official uh, distillery bottlings are offered up as Glen Deverin. And the, um, the marketing team, the geniuses over there that don't lean into the name that's much easier to pronounce and cooler, because you can say on McDuff, as um, I spent the night on McDuff, uh, they actually decided to go with the older age statement. That's when they call it the Deverin, not Glen Deverin. And that's when they're in the 18 year range, I believe it is. This is a 12 so, as the Deverin. Really? Okay, so that's another the change that they've made. Ago. Yeah. Okay, that's another change that they've made in the last little while. That's when, that's when head office starts mucking with things, to be honest. Uh, I find it very, very odd. And you still don't see that many distillery offerings. I jumped on this because I haven't had a bad one, to be perfectly honest. And uh, first editions, this is the line that uh, the third generation created on their own. Uh, you made a, a little reference to uh, the uh, the Douglas Lang side of things. Now, a little bit of family gossip here. Um, the Douglas Lang Company and the Hunter Lang Company are linked in that the owners, uh, Fred Douglas Lang and Stuart Hunter Lang, are brothers. And um, they stopped getting along probably about 20 years ago. And, uh, and, the, and the sons, Andrew and Scott, that I mentioned earlier, and Andrew, who we worked with uh, in the last tasting, couldn't stand working with their uncle. And they actually went out on their own 
and started the first edition on their own. And they were able to utilize certainly some of those great relationships that their family business had had to get bought, to get barrels to uh, to do. But they decided to go with the cask strength style. Once uh, Fred and Stuart divided the company up, they came back into the fold and they brought first editions with them. So first edition is a reference to their love of uh, old books. They're super lit nerds. They, uh, they love an old... Uh, an old book that they can pick up at a uh, maybe a first edition used bookstore kind of thing. So uh, that's their reference there. And uh, working as a cask strength line, we're looking at 54.9%. Beautiful, uncharacteristically round age of, uh, of 20 years on this. I will also and just I, jump I, in I'd and say uh, that where the I didn't think the Sovereign needed water, and it changed with water, but it didn't necessarily improve. I actually like the McDuff better with a drop of water myself. Okay. Uh, I'm getting just an incredible puissance, really great strength off the nose. It really lifts out at its cask strength. Um, but a drop of water certainly doesn't doesn't hurt these, and you know how I do it. My, my literal drop of water is uh, just that. That beautiful hole in the uh, in the lid of my bottled water here. Um, also, everyone in the comments who's absolutely dessert. piling on Lee. Everyone in the comments piling on Lee. Just keep it up. I absolutely love it. You're making my whole night. I'm trying not to laugh while I'm watching this guy talk, um, and I'm just loving everybody just getting on Lee's case about this. This is great. About what? <laughs> oh no, I'm not telling you. I can't you. see the comments. <laughs> oh great. Okay. Have I? I was like, do I have something hanging off my face? Is there? Hmm. Well, now I'm self-conscious. I don't know what I'm going to do here if you guys are all looking at me and laughing. No, no, no. <laughs> it's I, I love the, uh, the strength of character. This isn't an old distillery. Uh, I believe like 1965 is, uh, is when it was founded. Yeah, we actually go from, you know, a single grain distillery to two 21st century di or 20th century distilleries. It's like one of the very last 18th century distilleries. We, we really... You know, we stick into this era of kind of the last big era for distillery expansion. Like that's when Kleinlish was refit. That's when uh, these two were built. Um, is it Deanston came out that era as well. Like there was quite a few distilleries built like right after the Second World War into the mid 1960s, and then it just stopped. Nothing in the 70s. Nothing in the 80s. Well, everything closed in the 80s. Nothing in the 90s, and then we started seeing like Kilholman was the first one, which was built in 07. Uh, Tamdu was in the 70s. Was Tamdu in the 70s? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Absolutely. You can see these waves of, uh, of popularity, and certainly after World War II uh, and right up into the 60s. Once uh, single malt or um, Scotch whiskey distilleries and, and the blends really started advertising over into international markets with the advent of TV, uh, with uh, American and Canadian servicemen coming back from World War II and enjoying the good stuff and the immigration that happened at that time. But it was really the advent of TV that made that big push happen in the 60s. Uh, TV and international print magazine that uh, and shipping uh, certainly got a lot easier once there weren't U-boats. <laughs> and, and let's be destroying. clear, like this, this wasn't where we, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation then. Like, you know, Glenn Fittick took a huge risk in the late 60s when they brought back single malts in their like stereotypical triangular bottle, but like the classic six was 1988. Like that was not that long ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there really yeah, wasn't, you know, right. multiple single malts for an export market uh, until the late 80s. So, you no, know, all of these whiskeys that were being built, they were all to supply the blending industry. Which is interesting because you had giants like Buchanan's and Bell's and Dewar's. And now, like, if I sell a bottle of blended whiskey, I'm genuinely surprised. It's, it's tough to think of these blended scotches being the absolute, you know, giants of the industry compared to single malt now. You know, you're absolutely right, but that is our market. And, uh, and we certainly have uh, a, a great group of uh, one percenters. And when we talk about single barrel single malts were the one percent of the one percent which is glorious and i'm gonna give you all guys a big air hug there because i love you for it but the reality of the industry is that it's still very much driven by blends uh the day-to-day -day, uh in uk and uh, a good chunk of eastern europe uh certainly uh south america is really still driven by uh, by the blends the gift giving culture of the asian market and what you can uh, what you can do with a 
uh, blue label Johnny Walker will cement you family business for life uh, kind of gift giving culture. It's it's amazing how different things are and the price tags that uh, that go along with single malt. I think are, are actually disproportionate for how great they are, especially when it comes down to or how distinctive they are, and especially when it comes down to the difference between uh, distillery offerings, which are amazing single malts, and then blends and then the single cask single malts that distillery offering single malt and casks uh, uh, single cask single malts that price tag to me i think should be higher compared no. to what they're selling <laughs> no no <laughs> it's easy for the guys selling the stuff right i think hey, it should be higher hey, i can remember be. having like uh, murray mcdavid silverton's on the shelf for like 46.95 for like a one of 300 bottling or one in 150 bottling that now would be ninety-five dollars. Like it's, it's it's gone up aggressively. I don't want it to go up anymore. I'm still trying to make a living here. Those, uh, those nine-year-old Mortlocks are, uh, were uh, were pretty good in those silver tins. That's for sure. And yeah, Craig, you're right. Like the classic six was a thing well into the '90s. But like my point is that launched in '88, and before that, Glenn Fiddick, Glenn Levitt. I'm trying to think of who else might have had a, a standard single in the market. Maybe Glenn Morangy. Um, I think my dad's watching. Uh, he might be actually the best person to ask. What was uh, what was the single malt market like there, Dad? Before uh, before the classic six launched, because I gotta think it was like Glenn Fiddick, Glenn Livett, not a whole lot else. Uh, Bullmore would be in that. Uh, would certainly be in that mix. Would I? Yeah. Um, just the the massive corporate. Uh, dollars they have behind them would would have pushed it out there. Surprisingly, I think Talisker was uh, was kicking around too, which in my mind is like middle tier as far as production and stream of consciousness when it comes to single malt. But uh, I know that it was it was fairly popular as well. So let's talk about the uh, the McDuff in our glass. What are we smelling? What are we tasting? Lee? I'll let you go first. Okay, so we absolutely. So we're looking at a, a refill hogshead. Just a, a beautiful, clean style. Uh, I'm getting a lot of those really kind of malty sugar, barley sugar kind of characters there. But this overwhelming, uh, I don't want to call it sweet because it's not sweet, but there's a real toffee uh, leather side of it is uh, is kind of that longer drawn out character and this beautiful lingering oak spice on the uh, on the finish. You know, I'm not getting it out of the little bottles, but I really got it out of the jugs when we were filling these bottles. Uh, the McDuff to me initially was absolutely bright, fresh uh, honey. Just raw honey was the big dominant note initially. Now it's almost getting more into like wood shavings, almost to pencil shavings. Not to the same degree that I get out of like a fetter can, but definitely into wood shavings, oak shavings. I don't think this is as fat as a fetter can too. It's not as oily as, no, uh, as those worm tub style. Really pretty. Uh, lots of great kind of apples, uh, granola kind of stuff on the nose, which kind of ties into that softer barley sugar quality that I was getting before, too. And I think it's holding alcohol really well. It is holding the alcohol very well. And also, Steve comes in with a swing and a miss on the Classic Six. Uh, he's right on uh, three out of the four. Uh, he has Dalwini, Oban, Talisker, Akintoshin, no, uh, and Lagavulin is the classic uh, six. He is right on Dalwini, Oban, Talisker, and Lagavulin. Uh, it was Glen Kinchy and Craganmore uh, to round out the classic six. Glen Kinchy. Yeah. Wow. God, that's an awful, awful distillery. I hate that whiskey so much. <laughs> you don't see me bringing in any. I have never seen one offered from uh, from any independent bottler. And I think like, that's probably not as much to do with Diageo as anything else. Like, when does when do any of the classic six, except maybe Talisker, ever come up for independence? You can actually find uh, Crag and Moore. Uh, the Talisker. The only time I've seen them through on the Hunter Lang side of things is when they bought them from uh, private buyers. So they're not getting offered. They're not getting the doors aren't opening for that. But there still are people that have bought barrels that are liquidating them on the private market. But you still never see Glen Kinchy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, a lowland whiskey. Uh, you know, I, I've had some amazing uh, Akintosh. I don't bring a lot of them uh, for kind of the same reason we talked about the um, uh, the North British. When I present them in tastings like this, they just get blown away. They could be amazing. But uh, anything outside of three wood, which is sugar to the bejesus, it's hard to make a dent. 
and uh, and Glenn Kinchy, there there's really nowhere to hide on the, on that style no, of, there's uh, no. of whiskey. And I, I just don't like it. I find it very plain, very ordinary. Um, it kind of reminds me of the the early space eyes bottlings, <laughs> bottlings when they were still bottling under drum gwish or whatever they started out bottling as, and the whiskeys were just so boring and so bad. Um, the most interesting thing about it was listening to people pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, and and technically, uh, Craig and Steve, um, I uh, you guys are on a five second tape delay, so uh, I actually did beat you, Steve. Uh, I can't remember if it's a five second or a ten second tape delay, but uh, there is actually a delay, uh, so. I, I am catching the comments 10 seconds before you guys are actually seeing uh, the video. So there is a bit of delay. There. Is that just in comments? It's not in a delay in the uh, in the audio feed? Uh, no, no. I'm not getting your audio 10 seconds later. This would be awful if that was the case. But no, well, you and I are, are uh, 10 seconds ahead of everyone else, more or less. Because I've been holding back the F-bombs, but if I don't have to... No, you know, I, keep it like um, keep PG thirteen. <laughs> we get back. like we get like half a dozen. <laughs> nice, six six F bombs allowed. Yeah. Uh, no, back to the whiskey. Uh, it, 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 it's a pleasure. I don't get them offered too often. I've had them offered at younger ages, twelve. I like them when they get a little longer in the tooth. Uh, you know, we, we're not going to see me release a twenty-seven-year-old McDuff anytime soon. I like them in this kind of middle. 15 to 22 range where you still get a lot of meat on the bones uh, otherwise i think they would just get too delicate and we would lose it um particularly on refill uh refill bourbon i think that those come out a little sweeter a little more textured when they're young but i think this is just hitting its stride holding that alcohol really well pushing out a lot of that fruit quality there the <laughs> supper's ready um it's my uh, smoke alarm going off uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everybody who just said Lee definitely jinxed himself in the comments, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, <laughs> so uh, one thing I wanted to actually, when, when you were talking about Lowland distilleries, I was actually going to say there's something in the McDuff that actually makes me think a little bit of Little Mill with that spicy green plant almost into like, um, almost into aloe sort of character. I'm really grooving on that. I think that's so pretty. I think that uh, where that's coming from, uh, lowland, especially younger lowlands, will have that, like I, I call it spearmint and that green kind of note to it, that little bit of menthol. And that's a, a genuine part of triple distillation. When we're looking at something like the McDuff, which is double distilled, but now we've got a little bit longer in the barrel, just as, uh, as tertiary characters can develop in, uh, in wines, where we've got really primary fruit characters first, and then we have those kind of vegetal things come through. I think the age on this one is what's bringing in that menthol character that would have been kind of hidden by, uh, by bigger, fatter fruit kind of qualities to it, or, or uh, the tarts and the, the apple characters that I mentioned earlier. But you're right, there is that beautiful seam of green that comes through. And I think that if this was bottled at 40% or even 46 I think we'd lose that. I think so, I think too. that's part of the alcohol coming through. It's a really fun note. And I, you know, I do hate to call you out, which is a lie. I love calling you out. Uh, but Little Mill is actually never triple spot. distilled. Bladnock did it. Glen Kinchy has done it. Auchentoshan does it a lot. St. Magdalene did it a bit. Little Mill never did, or at least never commercially. Really? If only we could call Little Mill, but they're closed. So there'll be no way to prove that I'm yes. right. Closed, burned down. Their smoke alarm went off too. Unfortunately, there was no one really immediately to hand. It did burn down. That's right. They burnt down. There's like a smokestack left, and then they bulldozed the rest. Yep. The Apparently, shame. you are scaring cats. Uh, we have at least two comments that your smoke alarm has terrified their cat. <laughs> Scarier than a cucumber? Come on. The world mm. may never know. All right, let's jump on to. Um, and this is a this is a bit of a talking point for me. I think five years ago, this McDuff would have been my favorite thing in the lineup just because it's so technical, it's so spicy, it's so interesting. Maybe I've changed as a whiskey drinker, but I've become such a horrible hedonist when it comes to my single malts now. This Tullibardine is so immediately likable and so generous and just so cheerful that it jumps out to me as my favorite just because there's all this apricot and tropical fruit and everything. And yes, it's the least expensive thing on the table. And is it, can I pull as many things out of this as I can in the McDuff? Absolutely not. But it's still like, 
having filled all these little bottles and taking a little nip here and there as I was filling them, because um, we have a waste ounce, you know, we do. Um, I really have kind of come around to this as being my favorite, at least in the early running. I really groove on how pretty this is. I love how just joyful this whiskey is. Nice. Um, so when I look at a list of, uh, of whiskeys to bring in, and, and I get a price list from Hunter Lang every month, and there's typically uh, six or seven between all the different lines, let's call it 10 new whiskeys every month to, uh, to really look at. And, uh, and sometimes I think, okay, well, Lafroig, duh, I know it's expensive, people are going to get mad at me, but they're going to buy it anyways. Yes. Because it's going to be that good. Um, but then there's stuff like, you know, your McDuff, that's for the geeks, and it gives, you know, geeks like Kyle and I great talking points, and it's really fun for us to pick these things up and talk about the Deborah and all that kind of stuff. And then I've got what I call order takers. I'm not going to sell a single bottle of Teleburnie. I'm just going to take orders for it. I'm going to flag, <laughs> throw the flag up, see who salutes. With a name like Teleburdy, with a distillery that I really like, a beautiful Highland distillery, not that old. This is another one that started up in the 60s. Um, the, the, the guy, and Kyle knows him well too, the guy that brings this into Alberta is one of the most likable whiskey agents around. I was going to so bring that up. Everybody loves Andy Dunn. Everybody loves Andy Dunn. And I had the, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about him in a bit. But uh, the, the, he's done such a great job of distributing and getting Teleburdine in front of them. You know, this isn't a, a, a poor distillery. They're owned by a French conglomerate. They've got a lot of great uh, Burgundy money behind them, as is evidenced by the wine uh, cask finishes that the distillery does. Um, they're based in uh, Pouligny Montrachet. But He's done such an amazing job. I mentioned that it's not a poor distillery because we see print advertising on Tullibardin. We see stuff out there. So this is why I call this one an order shaker. But I still have to literally stand behind it. So when I taste it, I'm like, okay, great. This is going to be something we can really work with. So what I have here is Hepburn's Choice. This is the kind of lowest tier by price and by age uh, for, uh, for the Lang family. Uh, this is a, a, a label that kind of bounced around and really didn't find its way until about two years ago, if I'm being perfectly honest. I've had distillery or had uh, offerings from Hepburn's Choice prior to now that I just wouldn't bring in. But they got a new cast program, or at least they did about 10 years ago, that uh, that started really kind of honing what it was going to be to make young whiskey. And here's where Andy Dunn's story comes up. I had the opportunity. I was pouring this in a store. Andy was there. I wanted to find out his opinion on the whiskey. And I asked him, like, what do you think? He's like, well, I really like it. And I said, but you've had so much Tullibardine in your life. Is it representative? And he said, no joke. It's actually more representative than the distillery offerings because the distillery offerings are coming out at 43%. And we've got the joy of these what, 319, 359 bottles at 46%. Yes. And they're using a burgundy cask for the wine or for the whiskey like they did with uh, with the Tullibardine wine offerings too. So it's 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 all right there. It is a textbook Tullibardine not from Tullibardine. Yeah. And you know it's funny so, I Tullibardine comes in these really classy kind of, you know, very fancy, very modern square boxes that I personally kind of hate. And I will point out that nothing to do with the whiskey inside. Uh, and this is a wine cast Tullibardine. Um, Tullibardine actually does come in three different wine finishes. It comes in Sauterne, Burgundy, and Sherry finishes. Uh, we carry two out of the three. Um, Tullibardine is just great out of wine cast. But I hate these boxes because they remind me that they're not the tubes. Because I can remember buying that like 1993, like 16 year old for 59.95. Mm -hmm. And there was the, like 1988, 20 something year old. It was like, 80 something dollars and it was just the cheapest way to get into and the packaging itself was terrible it, it looked like trash um but you know it was the early 2000s everything looks bad uh except for cloudy uh which looked like miles ahead of everyone <laughs> um yes. but yeah like i can remember buying those telebardines for just no money and getting into like we were talking about this being this great value in a 21 year old for 150 dollars i can remember buying that 1988 for like Sticker price on the shelf, eighty two ninety five. I got a staff discount. Like, granted, this was the Wild West days, but I just remember Tullibardine just being this. Oh, I'm buying something, but I want something soft and old. Tullibardine. I went through just buckets of it back in the day. Just buckets. Yeah, of it. yeah, absolutely. 
and, and, and the fact that Andy was behind it certainly made it easier to do. Um, there's a couple of cool talking points when it comes to uh, this independent Teleburden uh, or Teleburdine, however you, uh, whatever you fancy. I mentioned earlier there's 359 bottles. Um, what I like in particular about this is we've, we've already talked about it being at 46%. Uh, another note is that it's from a wine barrel. We've already chatted about that. But the real neat note wine? about wine Sorry, barrels. I'm jumping in just really It was, it was a, a burgundy, a Pinot Noir. It was a Pinot Noir barrel? Okay. Yeah. So what the, what the neatest thing about it coming from a wine barrel is, is not only do we have a different wood to whiskey ratio. These are smaller than a hogshead. So we've got a better uh, wood to whiskey ratio. And uh, now we're talking about French oak. So we're adding another X factor that's going to give this that kind of, not only do we have the wine character kind of soaking in from the wood, but now we've got French oak character coming in too. And I think that's where this beautiful biscuit kind of cookie textural thing is happening. The texture is certainly from the red wine tannins, but there's a soft kind of graham cracker cookie thing going on that's in behind the fruit, behind the kind of orange and spice and cinnamon that's uh, that's happening there that i i, I just love and that's a a classic uh, french wine note for the people who are saying plum or plum pudding i'm definitely getting that and the the plum with a little bit of ginger notes that i'm getting is almost making me think like plum sauce um not bad plum sauce that you get like with your chicken fingers at boston pizza or something but like really good plum sauce um there's some of that <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Actually, soft you know what? There's like a, an umami thing going on with that with that ginger plum sauce. There's like a uh, a soy umami kind of mushroomy uh, texture earthiness that's in behind those sweet characters that I, that I like about it too. And that has to be coming from the Burgundy barrel because like Tullibardine's pretty darn landlocked. Uh, it's not coming from like yeah. sea spray. It's not a Speyside saltiness. There's that no has safe, to be coming from sweet. the Pinot Noir cask. There's nowhere else it could come from. Yeah. Dates is a really good one. Apple crumble is a great one. Uh, oily, slippery thing on the finish. Thank you, Sean. Let's talk a little bit about independent bottlers versus uh, distillery bottlers. Maybe a little bit in brief, just in terms of how they treat the whiskey or maybe better phrased, what they don't do to the whiskey. Perfect. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that the um, uh, distillery offerings are coming out at 43%. Uh, so that means that they... Um, they can add caramel, uh, they can chill filter, but uh, I think at 43 it means that they are not adding caramel, but they are doing some chill filtration. Um, I, I'm working with another distillery nowadays, uh, Tom and Tool and Glen Cadam, and Tom and Tool does chill filter, and we've long treated it like it was the uh, the devil when it comes to uh, when it comes to whiskey, the the addition of caramel or chill filter, chill filtering is the process of homogenizing several barrels of whiskey. And it's something that you as a consumer would want to have a consistent flavor profile. So when you bought one bottle to the next, you would have the same taste of whiskey. And to do that, they have to strip the oils up. That's where they chill it down and they the oils become solid and then they pass it through a gauze filter. Anybody that cooks, anybody that prepares food knows that fat is flavor. And in some of those barrels, the fat that is left over from that distillation is wonderful. And some of them, it's not so wonderful. So they strip those flavors out and then they would add uh, caramel and you're left with the heart of the whiskey at X percent. Uh, add water as well. What we don't do is that chill filtration step. We don't need to homogenize this single barrel. We want to showcase the originality and the uniqueness of it. So that's where that oily texture is coming in. That's why the addition of water will bloom. Uh, uh, all of the whiskeys we have tonight, or none of them are chill filtered. Uh, some of them certainly are holding their alcohol better than others. But the water that we're adding is not necessarily to tame the alcohol. It's to activate the oil. And by adding that drop, you can get more character, more flavor by activating the oil that we leave in. And that's going to stick to your palate. But there's definitely a very, very um, correct note to say oily and slippery. Yep. I will also point out that chill filtration does have a place in the industry. Um, I'll point out that there's a difference between buying a bottle of, you know, Heinz ketchup versus, you know, Uncle Lee's organic all natural heirloom tomato, you know, one of 500 bottles of ketchup. And what I mean by that is, 
you know, this Hepburn's Choice, there's 359 bottles in the world. They are, you know, to a point not expecting a whole lot of repeat business, at least not for this bottle. So if this bottle tastes slightly different from the other bottle on the shelf, uh, and all of you, because uh, we actually sold three different sets coming from three different bottles uh, of this tasting, uh, so some of you have very different tasting bottles of this at home. Um, the idea of whiskey as art, as this is a expression of Tullibertine that is very different from every other, that's something that people who buy independent bottlings and I think people who buy single bottle scotch as a whole understand and appreciate and in certain cases want. It's almost like vintage to vintage variation on wine versus this is a bottle of Johnny Walker Red Label. Say what you like about it, but if I got a bottle of Johnny Walker Red Label last week and I drank it and, you know, I hated myself because I finished a bottle of Johnny Walker Red Label in a week and I got <laughs> another one this week, and they tasted wildly different from each other, they wouldn't be doing a good job. Uh, chill filtration, that homogenization, is whiskey as a product that you want to be repeatable and sustainable and the customer can build a loyalty to because it's always the same, versus whiskey as art where there's 359 bottles of it in the world, and if you decide it's your favorite thing ever and you want to buy six, Lee and I thank you, but that's not really part of the business model. It's designed to be a wonderful experience, and then you'll be like, okay, I finished my Talabardin, I have money in my whiskey budget again, what's next? And it's a different sort of market. Um, I think chill filtration gets a, in the context of high-end whiskey, very bad name. Like if I buy a $200 whiskey, it had damn well better not be chill filtered, but it definitely has a place when you're talking about Johnny Walker should always taste like Johnny Walker because that's how their brand identity works. Yeah, that uh, the commodification uh, that um, you will have a consistent experience. These aren't bad guys. These are these are guys creating a consistent experience, and that to me showcases where some of the talent in the industry lies as well. The guy that can put together that blend. You think about we talk about. Uh, this distillery was sold to this guy or this company and it's changed hands, but the blends still exist and the blends still taste the same, even though the ingredients that are going into it likely have changed year to year. When we taste an independent bottled whiskey, a finite number of 359 bottles, we are enjoying a moment in time, a, a solitary experience that, uh, or <laughs> If you're doing it one ounce at a time, uh, these 700 mLs, we're, we're going to enjoy 24 solitary experiences. Um, and then when it's gone, it's gone. So these are really a moment in time, something to be savored while you're doing it. Whereas you can maybe turn off the savoring hat when you're going to buy something that is dependable and repeatable. I also enjoy the irony that everyone in the comments is getting really geeky about the fact they can see a Douglas Lang bottle behind me during our Hunter Lang tasting. Uh, yes, fight, there is an fight, old particular fight, behind fight. me. Uh, it is, uh, well, it's actually just one listing. I pulled it across so the shelf behind me didn't look empty. Um, it is a Brave All 20 year at 51.5%, uh, which I have not tasted because we, uh, we brought in a six pack at Christmas and I still have five of them and I have no idea who bought the one. So never had it, Telling. no idea what it's about. Uh, and as a good example of, wow, 20 year old whiskeys tend to be expensive. That is a $250 bottle of Brave All. Uh, versus the 150 that'll get you into a sovereign. So, yeah. There's also two more showcases. Yeah, I was So, yeah, we're going to just uh, pause for one second here and talk a little bit about what we've got for coming attractions. Uh, and it's a bit of a different one this time. Um, the beer tasting is a purely indulgent thing on me. Uh, I had to do the Love Shack, so this is coming up Wednesday. Uh, for those not familiar, Love Shack is a pair of beers. One brewed at 88, one brewed at Cabin, two of my absolute favorite breweries. Uh, they both did their own take on a passion fruit hazy IPA. Uh, and they each brewed them in their own facility. So we're going to do both side by side. Uh, we are definitely sold out of the 88 now. I think we maybe have one or two four packs left of the cabin. At least we did three or four hours ago when I walked by the uh, display case uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, so we're going to do those side by side. Now, I've been wanting to do this for bloody ages. Uh, the issue is um, we had so many really cool brewmasters and like agents and everything else lined up for like the last couple of three weeks that it's just kind of been pushed and pushed and kicked down the road. So screw it, this is the last possible week I can do this, so I'm gonna do it now. So I need kind of a second half of this. Uh, I'm gonna do, 
I think a really fun topic in super low alcohol beers. Snake Lake came up with a couple of really interesting ones. Uh, they have a, a low alcohol like session IPA uh, called Drink Easy uh, at 3.9%, and then they have a, a mild porter at 3.4. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the difficulty of making a low alcohol beer and the various problems that that presents in terms of body and richness and sweetness, and maybe it starts to taste astringent. So it's kind of two tastings in one, purely to indulge me and the fact I wanted to do Love Shack. Now, on the wine side, next Friday night, so one week from tonight, uh, it's bloody warm outside. I don't know what it's like in Calgary, but it's really nice here. Uh, so we are Calgary. going to do our Welcome to Spring tasting. And yes, like most of them are, it's entirely to indulge me uh, because it's my tasting mm -hmm. series and I wanted to show a couple of things off. So we've got a couple of things that are a little older. Um, I thought that the most interesting kind of summer wines, spring wines that we showed last year were the Cote Giacobbe Pinot Grigio, the wine I liked so much that I actually bought a international pallet of it because it kept selling out at Liquor Connect. So I just said, screw that noise and I bought a pallet of it. We're just at the very tail end of that pallet and I still have a little bit left. This rules and it's actually gotten better for kind of sitting in the, the warehouse over the winter. It's in a really neat place right now. It used to be all grapefruit. Now it's a little more kind of apple and pears and softer fruits. It's very pretty. Uh, then we're going to get to Gainsa Chacolina. Uh, this is kind of from that north coast of Spain, kind of the Spanish answer to a vino verde. Um, I don't know. The, I think the reason this wine doesn't sell better is like the name is spelled uh, T-X-A-K-O-L-I-N-A. -A. It's Chacolina, but I couldn't have told you that unless I knew it. Um, fantastic, like super bright, fresh summer wine. Uh, a wine that we brought in in fall, this is the, the Vera Longue Rosso. Uh, this is, we brought it in, in fall, but it's very much a spring red. Uh, so this is from the Longue. This is where kind of your, your off cuts of Barolo and Barbaresco come from. There is Nebbiolo in here. There's also some Lagrain. There's some Dolcetto and Barbera. It's just a lovely, light, fresh, fun spring wine. This shouldn't have done as well as it has over the winter. But now that it's into spring, this is this wine's time to shine. And then, then we have this Revel Cider, uh, which is, honestly, I think, A, we bought basically everything that came to Alberta. Uh, this is something that has sold almost as well to staff as it has to customers. We all absolutely love this. It's an apple cider base uh, with strawberries, cherries, and then Zweigelt grape skins added. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's completely sold out at Connect now because I bought it all. Uh, this this rules. Um, this is kind of going to be, I think, the highlight of the night because it's also the cheapest thing because it's a cider, not a wine. It's going to be a really, really fun one. And we're just going to welcome spring a little bit. Of course, now that I've done that, I probably cursed us all to an unseasonable spring blizzard on the day of the tasting so that none of the wines show well. But, you know, that's that's just the game we play when we pick these things out a week early. Lee, thank you for bearing with us. Let us talk about this Blair Athol, shockingly not from a damn sherry barrel. Because uh, they're all from Isn't sherry that, barrels. They, they usually are, yeah, absolutely. And I, I have, um, this is one of three uh, Blair Athol that I have in my portfolio right now. I've got two 15-year-old statements from Old Mall Cask, one sherry, one bourbon. And, uh, and we're tasting the bourbon one tonight. And in particular of uh, note, we're not talking about a hogshead, we're talking about a bourbon barrel. So we're looking at, uh, depending on how they rebuild the, uh, the hogshead, uh, a bourbon barrel is typically 200 liters and a hogshead is 225 to 250, depending on how many staves they use. So we, again, we've got a smaller uh, vessel here that is gonna kind of macro age it. And I've had the good fortune of being able to taste side by each, both of my 15s, uh, the one in Sherry, which is not surprising, darker in color, but a great note, this one has a little bit more sweetness and a little bit more texture. Bourbon, particularly a bourbon barrel like this, not a hogshead, will yield uh, that sweeter kind of toffee character at a younger age. We need a longer time with the bigger vessel of a sherry barrel to get that sherry sweetness happening, but the color comes out right away. So we've got this beautiful, soft, golden color to it. I'm getting uh, this incredible toffee, but not sweet toffee, just uh, just the note, of the, the, the presence of potential sugar, 
but I'm not having a sweet whiskey here on the palate. Which is kind of nice because it's not sherry aged. I always think of Blair Athol's being a very sweet whiskey, which is because of the constant presence of sherry. The fact this is a little drier and a little spicier, and also the fact that this is not the oldest whiskey on the table. It's not the strongest whiskey on the table. It's maybe the most recognizable brand, but I'd say it's arguably the Talabardin, and it still ends up Amongst the, the nerds, for sure. Yeah. It's the most recognizable indie, for sure. But that beautiful cinnamon, that wonderful wood spice on the finish, the length that it gives, you made the right call putting this one last. I would have been tempted to put the higher alcohol last uh, with the McDuff, but I think the way we rolled this out is just perfect. We get that beautiful bourbon sweetness. This is all about uh, wood contact. Uh, as the I learned this term from, uh, from a uh, Jack Daniels guy, the wood science here is just really, really showing up. At, at a not particularly old age. It's not the youngest whiskey we've ever had, of course, but it's not particularly old. We get this amazing strength of character from the wood, and that uh, that that is whiskey in a nutshell. We think we're drinking this. What we're drinking is wood influence, and, uh, and we've got this beautiful barley sugar kind of background, but that spice, that length, uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, this make this, uh, th this is like uh, a creme brulee without the sugar on top. I was going to say like raisin French toast. Thing. Yeah, it's, it's just exactly <laughs> nice. that sort of thing. And just a beautiful way to finish. Um, Blair Athol is kind of a, kind of a darling amongst the, uh, the independent uh, bottling set. Uh, this is uh, owned by Perno Ricard. Uh, sorry, it goes into the Bell's Blend. It's owned by Diageo. Uh, it goes into the Bell's Blend. This is uh, from Pitt Lockery. Uh, same hometown as uh, Edward Hour, which we've done lots of work with in the past, but kind of an unsung hero in the uh, in the in the big world. But it is the backbone, of probably one of the most palatable blends out there. The Bell's Blend is nothing to shake a stick at. You've got uh, a really easy drinking style of blended whiskey, and it's due in no small part. Uh, to the success of what Blair Athol has been able to do since 1898. And you referenced that earlier. This is kind of one of the, the no, 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 second... No, not 1898, 1798. It's Seven, really sorry, old. It predates, it predates the, uh, the Excise Act of 1823. It does. It's one of the very few that do. Yeah. Uh, I did want to just... Uh, let's, let's just go with a snap question for fun. Of, you know, you can't say something like uh, a Delphi's blend of like recognizable blended whiskeys. Gun to your head, what's your favorite? White Horse. Wow. I was going to go Teachers, but White Horse is a good answer. <laughs> Do they even sell I've had White Horse in the UK, but I don't think they even sell it here. You can only get it in the UK. That's yeah. sort of like nobody can prove me wrong. All right, fine. Of, Actually, th of things honest. that people here would be familiar with. Um, uh, Bell's Grants. Uh, I've, I've got uh, Famous Grouse is, uh, is another one I like. Nice chunk of uh, McAllen in that. Um, but yeah, I, I, picked, <laughs> I picked White Horse to be a jerk. I, honestly, probably Famous Grouse is, uh, is one that I, uh, I, I can lean on. I'm going to stick with Teachers. I do love me some Teachers. Teachers with the um, Ardmore. With, the, with a little bit of Pete. You know me too well. Uh, so yeah. we got some rankings coming in. I'm just going to go through those a little bit. Uh, Mike McDonald has the McDuff first and the Talabardine last. Breaking my heart, mm. Mike. Um, <laughs> Danuta has exactly the same thing. Uh, which, you know what? Fair enough. I, I, my opinions are my own, and they've also changed over the course of the night. Uh, John has the Sovereign number one. That's fun. All uh, right, John. Yeah, Kev Kevin's got... Uh, Kevin actually was in an inverse order. He starts here and actually... No, not quite. He goes four, two, three, one. Beautiful. Uh, Elizabeth had a 2 4 1 3. Uh, Craig coming in with the Talabarnius is number one. Out of white, Craig. Uh, I say that although my vote is probably going to change at some point. Lee has the number one first. It's, you know what? I will say this uh, without going through all of them and boring everyone to tears. Um, I like that it's a very mixed bag. I mean, I've seen every single different whiskey kind of listed. Uh, as a number one, I know when I was talking through them, uh, there was not a lot of votes to the Blair Athol, but both Sean and Michelle had it both as their number one in back-to-back -back comments. Um, lots of love for a lot of different ones here. Uh, I like that it's, I like that it's varied. 
Uh, I like that there isn't a consensus because that makes it more fun for me. It really does. I think that's amazing. That shows uh, just how varied the crowd is and how diverse the selection is. I th that's amazing. That is, it, you know, if we walk into a tasting and we sell everything of one or two and none of the others, that's an unsuccessful tasting. That uh, we've, we've made people unhappy with a whiskey. At least here we know where we're making somebody happy with every single one of these. And that's why this, uh, you know, what? you said that this was the right time for the Blair Athol. This was not how we initially drove it up at all. We did not have the 15 year at 50% alcohol at the tail end of the tasting. Uh, I initially had the McDuff right at the tail end, and then we tasted the McDuff, or well, we tasted the Sovereign, and was like, yep, that's first. We knew that was first. It's a single grain. It has to be first. Doesn't matter how old it yep. is. Doesn't matter the alcohol. It's going to be first. Um, we actually really labored on these two and the order on these two. The end of the result was that the Tullibardine really buried the McDuff, even with the higher alcohol. But the Blair Athol, by the time we got to that, we were like, nope, that's consensus, the end whiskey. It has to be. It's bigger than everything else. Which is interesting because it's not the oldest, it's not the highest alcohol, it's not out of like a big chunky flavorful barrel like a sherry barrel or wine barrel. It's an ex-bourbon whiskey at 50% alcohol, it's as middle of this road as you could get and yet it's so characterful and so big. It's that wood to whiskey ratio, that smaller barrel. This is the smallest barrel that we've got. Uh, actually, no, sorry, the Tullibardine would probably be the smallest barrel. But uh, we're talking about American oak, which is just going to beat up. <laughs> Uh, beat up a, a nice, delicate Blair Athol out of the still. So I think that you made the right call. That beautiful, cinnamony, wonderful finishing note of spice is... Would, it would have informed the other whiskeys. It would, it would have carried over into the McDuff if we had served that last. It honestly crushed the McDuff. It was, that was originally how I had it, was the Sovereign into the Tullibardine, uh, into the Blair Athol, into the McDuff, and we tried them in that order. The... Yeah, the, the Blair Athol just absolutely buried the McDuff because the McDuff's so pretty and delicate. It just, it couldn't show against it. It's just too different of whiskey, which is interesting. 54.9% doesn't often go to hand in hand with delicate, but you're absolutely right. It really does have that long, plush, a uh, uh, measured response. Whereas we get a little bit of a, a little bit of a punch in the uh, uvula with the, uh, with the Blair Athol, that, that stronger, spicy finish. Lee, do you have a favorite of everything you tasted tonight? Is there anything here that would be, this has to be, I know they're all in your liquor cabinet because you're a whiskey agent, so obviously they're all in your liquor cabinet. Is there anything here on the table that you're like, yep, if I was a customer, this is the thing I would have to have in my liquor cabinet tonight? Honestly, you nailed it when you said it's neat to see a non-sherry Blair Athol. And, uh, and the, the bourbon barrel uh, quality of this with, uh, with that beautiful spice, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say how much I like that whiskey. And I've just been knee deep in Blair Athol probably my whole career. And this one's showing up so, so well. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to eat some crow and say that Blair Athol's right there for me in second place. And I don't like saying it because I usually give Steve so much hell for liking Blair Athol so much. I'm actually <laughs> going to give it to the McDuff. The McDuff really taught me things about whiskey as a whole. I wasn't expecting that nice. over-the-top honey character, which if you do end up getting a bottle, it didn't translate to little bottles, which is a shame, but it really does show up in a big way whenever you're filling this out of jug, which means it will show up when you pour it straight out of a bottle. And then that, that green plant spiciness, that, that fresh growing things, almost mossiness uh, that I love so much out of Little Mill. I got just enough of that captured in the McDuff um, I really love that. Um, the Tullibardine, Free cooked which, I, plantain. which I came into tonight saying was probably going to be my favorite, that, that has to fall to number three. Uh, and then the Sovereign Four, just, it's a, it's a strong lineup, and I don't like whiskey normally at that old. Uh, I know I picked a 20 year old as my favorite, but yeah, that's just an exceptional bottling of McDuff for me. And unusually for me, it's the most expensive thing on the table because usually I don't go that way, but I uh, know tonight the McDuff's worth it for me. I'll tell you something, that, um, that bottling, uh, I brought in, I tasted it, I knew it was good, and I brought it in, I brought 20 cases in, and uh, typically if I'm going to bring in more than 10 or more than 15, uh, it's because I've already got a home for it, I, I know who's going to be taking it, but I brought in that much, and I've shown it to four people, and it's, it's spoken for. It, yep. it, it like you, you're not alone is what I'm trying to say is it uh, my instincts were good I only had to show it to four people and 
it's gone. It is. It is. Well, you've got some in your allocation, but it is. Uh, my damn, it's an exceptional allocation. I, this is not going to stick around. Long. <laughs> it's like I'm going to need to make some calls. Give me a minute. No, it, it's 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 a fun thing to deal with the finite product. I mean, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm working with Tomatong, Glen Cadam, uh, and they're beautiful, repeatable things that everybody should have in their liquor cabinet at all times, daily drivers, all of that, but. These are the special things, and if I do it right, I've got just enough to make people happy. Yep. Too and little, that's the, that's I mean, the other thing. Like, mad. Too much, I'm trying to flog it. Yeah, right? and that's the other interesting thing is, you know, we, we talked about 20 cases. Those are cases of six. It's 120 bottles for all of Alberta, and that's a big order. I mean, there's a lot of things that come to Alberta where it's like the entire provincial allocation is nine bottles. It's like, oh, good. Like you got one. There's 199 bottles of this made. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got a high five from Andrew on that one. Hey, all right. Great. Thanks, man. You know, I bought most of it. All right. Uh, I want to thank a couple of people here uh, who came in, at least for the first time I've seen them as uh, commenters. And thank you so much for attending. Uh, I haven't seen you before as a guest. I really appreciate you dropping by. Um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a really neat night. I, I've really enjoyed this. Um, Robert, thank you as well. This has been a really fun one. Um, is this Mc, uh, Steve asks, is this McDuff different to the one we had a year or so ago? It definitely is because this just got here. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. No, it's absolutely different. I think that was younger too. Was it still first edition? So I feel like that was old mall cask. Uh, I think it was the first edition. Okay, then. I'm oh, wrong. no, no. Sorry, you're right. It is old mall cask. It was okay. old mall. It was old mall cask, but it is different. Different barrel. Cool. All right, well, uh, Lee, I'll ask you to stick around on the line while I wrap up and we'll debrief after. But uh, I think we'll call that a, uh, a great success of a whiskey tasting. That was a lot of fun. Any, uh, any final comments there, Lee? And it's a job for me too, but it happens to be a really, really fun one. And I think we made it through the whole night without a single f bomb, which is great. Um, so you know, unfortunate. We had a, we had a limit of six, and we used none of them. Can you say his like, yeah. ado again? Because the audio was screwed up. Oh, was the audio screwed up for Lee's good night? Yes, well, this got this got trozoed. Um, so Lee, would you like to say your good night again? Apparently, Aaron just trozoed it up. So. This time with feeling. This time with feeling. I love you guys. I hope to see you in person really soon. Thank you for sharing this with me. It is a passion. It is a job. Thank you for sharing my passion while I do my job. Awesome. Thanks, Lee. Uh, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton. This was our Whiskey Tasting number five. Join us next week for my completely self-indulgent Love Shack beer tasting uh, and then our Wines of Spring in the theory that, you know, it's going to stay warm in a week, which, of course, it won't because just my karma doesn't work that way. Uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Lee. Uh, with Andrew Hilton, I'm Kyle. That was Aaron. That was Lee. This has been a lot of fun. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>